My name is Maria Shabla, and I'm an Air Force vet, and my father was an Air Force EOD tech who retired at Eglin. Um, as a financial assistance and resources coordinator, I have the honor of working with EOD techs and their families that are going through difficult times um, and helping with financial grants and also resources. I joined the foundation last September, and within the first six months, I worked directly with six EOD families that had lost someone to suicide. And I will never forget the funeral I attended and seeing a six-year-old boy um, cry out during the service that he wanted his daddy. Last year, we had the highest number of suicides in our community that we have ever seen. And the EOD Warrior Foundation made a commitment to help remove the stigma surrounding mental health, which prevents our warriors from getting the care that they need and that they deserve. Sherry Bett told me when I first started, and before she retired, that the mental health crisis we were seeing was what she called the aftermath of the aftermath. Warriors had come back from the war and doctors and nurses had done their best to save their lives and to mend their broken bodies. But what we didn't know then was that the invisible wounds of traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, hypervigilance, moral injuries, toxic exposures, and the list goes on, which we could not see would soon plague our community and result in suicide if our warriors did not get the help that they needed. This is the reason that we're here today. We're here to come together as a community, to listen to each other's stories, to find strength in each other, and to come to understand that mental health is just as important, if not more than physical health. And it's not just the EOD warrior's mental health that is important. It's their families as well, who have to navigate the everyday stressors of the military lifestyle, from moving to new base, bases, deployments, their children having to make new friends, having to find daycare, et cetera. Today, we have three guest speakers, John Clem, an Army EOD vet, who will share his personal story with us, Jeff Truex with After the Long Walk to talk about how their organization started and what they're doing to support our community, and Dr. Thomas Kruger, a licensed psychologist and EOD spouse, to talk to us about what we can do if our spouse or a loved one is showing signs that they may harm themselves or others. Our first speaker, John Clem. John enlisted in the Army in the June of 1993 as a personnel administrative specialist. He volunteered for explosive ordnance disposal duty in 1997 and graduated in March of 1998. Prior to his retirement, John served in a variety of active duty and National Guard operational and institutional assignments in the US and abroad. John continues his government service as a Department of Army civilian at the US Army Ordnance School, Fort Lee, Virginia, as a division chief for the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Training Division. John is here today to share his own personal story and hopefully to inspire others who may be struggling themselves to reach out for help. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah I got it. Facebook. <laughs> All right. Everyone hear me okay? So, yes, I am uh, John. Uh, one thing I that wasn't mentioned is that I'm also an alcoholic. I want everyone to know I am an alcoholic. That's who I am. Um, by no means. Well, I'd be share, like sharing my deployment history, deployment anything, because people on the Zoom probably have more stories that I need, experiences that I can relate to. Um, they've seen a lot more than I've ever, uh, I've seen. So what I'm gonna share is my past couple of years after, before I got out and up to my attempt. So I uh, was in the Guard, National Guard at 430 at the OD for majority of my last couple of years of service. Um, within the guard, you actually know when you're going to retire, um, or you you don't have to re-enlist. You don't have an indefinite contract, so I knew when I was going to get out. So that that was supposed to be in uh, May of 2017. So I knew I was going to get out. I had personal reasons. My my family talked to my my wife, um, talked to my um, my father was in bad health, and so I I knew I was going to get out in May of 2017. Um, and around 2016, the 430th, the end of 2016, the 430th was identified as being a unit deployed to Afghanistan. So I had to relook at my 
what I was going to do um, and talk to my wife, talk to my family, talk to the unit because I wanted their share, their also their input. Um, and they let me, they gave me the thumbs up, go ahead and retire top. We got this. So I retired. Um, I, of course, went to all their training events that I could to. They went to Fort Pickett. Um, I went there. They gave me my PCS award, um, I, or my, my retirement award, and I, uh, I think I kept them out a little bit too late. Um, I think the, the commanders got, 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 a little, got a little upset, um, but I was glad to share that experience with them and sending them off. Um, so after I retired, uh, now we're in 2018, October of 2018. I am a um, Department of the Army civilian at Fort AP Hill, um, where news of a soldier from the 430th um, came down the works um, that a soldier was KIA. Um, his name was Sergeant James A. Slate. So once I, you know, I got the I got word that he uh, had passed and I am like trying to think what I can do where I'm at because I'm not with that unit. I wanted to be there with that unit. Um, there, I, I wanted to be there with that family. I kept thinking of the family, um, then getting that, that knock on the door. So I couldn't do that. Um, so I went home, of course, called my wife on the way home and just started just crying because I couldn't do anything. Um, I just, I, it's a long drive from where I live to Fort AP Hill, about two hour drive of just me thinking, what could, what, what can I do? Um, so what I did do was I basically drank a lot of bourbon that night. I, that's what I did. Maker's Mark, bullet bourbon. That's, it was in my cabinet. That's what I drank. Um, you know, after time progressed, I was able to pay my respects, at the, you know, at his uh, service. Um, and then the, the spiral just kept going. Like, I, it, it, it just kept going, my downward spiral. Um, I noticed that I wasn't sleeping a lot. Um, I needed alcohol to help me sleep, to at least get four hours of sleep. Um, I noticed that... I was getting aggravated very easily. Road rage, like I, if someone cut me off, I was like basically trying to draft them for miles. I was on their bumper, just waiting. So it was just that 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 I just that I was just mad. Um, so that led up to me. Um, Me having episodes of blacking out when I drank, of waking up. One instance, I woke up and I thought I was in my bathroom. I I could feel around. I had I swear I was up, but I couldn't find how to get out. I I had to get out by yelling for my wife and my dog so she could hear me in my own bathroom. The next time uh, was a uh, a song would come over the the on a over the speakers. It was a certain song. Every time I heard it, I would start crying. The last time I heard it before I saw saw it help, I basically fell on the ground and started crying, and was had a panic attack. Of course, alcohol was also related to this. So going to February 5th to February 6th of this year, we had a friend over at my house. There was drinking involved, um, but that drinking also continued the next day. I did not stop drink. I basically went on a binge. My binge lasted the 5th, the 6th, where I went and started driving around. I drove, um, and what does what does a drunk guy do? Well, I went and got a new truck. Yeah, 
got a new truck, signed for the new truck. I was there, like, I didn't even want the guy to, uh, like, I didn't want to drive the truck. Like, I almost wanted him to drive it for me, but I'll ask him what he thought of the truck, you know, instead of me driving it and getting pulled over while doing a test drive. But I knew that was, I was doing that. I knew I was doing something wrong. From there, I went to uh, drinking establishments within um, the Petersburg, Fort Lee area, the Tri-Cities there. Um, and the last establishment closed, saying that they're going to close. So I basically chugged a couple beers um, to say, okay, I guess I'm going home. So I got in my truck, started driving, and then I forgot where I was. I could not figure out where I was in my own truck. Luckily, I had GPS. I figured out how to work the new GPS in the new truck. And it got me home for grace of God, your higher power got me home. When I got home, I was so scared of what I've done because I was putting other people's lives in danger by driving and drinking and driving that I was ashamed. I felt lonely. I felt depressed. So I pulled up, got to my driveway, pulled up my where I lived at home and noticed I urinated all over myself. I was that scared. That was an embarrassment to, my, to me that that happened. So what I did was, I'm, I'm done. I'm done feeling like this. I want to sleep. I wanted to sleep forever. My wife, because I've told her years before that I thought about suicide, has hit my weapon. Who knows if she had not hit that weapon years before, what would have happened? I have no idea where it is. I still don't even look where it is. Don't even try to find it. So no one, the reason why I told I spoke, spoke to her on that is because so we have a I we don't have any kids. We have dogs. We love our dogs. They're our kids. I did not want her to come into the house with my head blown off and our dogs covered in my blood. I did not want that. So what I decided, and seeing as she hid the weapon, I decided I was gonna go to fall asleep in a nice hot tub. Just let the heatness just lax me and just go to, let's go to sleep. So I made a decision, I asked for help. I reached out on Facebook, people, you got <laughs> Jeff, the, the group, that you guys created made people aware of my issues. There was a uh, one of my former uh, officers I worked with um, in the guard. Later, found I found out that his daughter was was one of the first ones that saw that message and reached out to her dad. People were calling me. I was hanging up on him. I like I knew I had that decision was there. So I got in the hot tub, pulled the cover over, and just laid there waiting. Unbeknownst to me, but luckily what I did was I called or I texted my wife saying, I urinated over myself, I'm crying, come home. Because generally on those times that I've been blacking out, she was home and be able to talk me down. She was at work. She contacted some friends, called 911. And the last, the one thing I remember is after getting in the hot tub, pulling the cover over, I remember my wife saying he can breathe. He's breathing after she pulled me out. And I fell flat on the, on the ground, and I think EMS and the, and the uh, first responders showed up approximately about the same time. So from there, I got in the, they basically took my vitals, you know, put me in the, uh, the ambulance, um, which they asked me, do you want to go voluntarily or do you want us to take you? 
the, probably a good choice to go voluntary when anyone asks you that. I didn't know what that meant, but I'm volunteered for this one. Um, so I went, we got to the ER. Uh, basically the ER was there. Um, I was being irate. I was a irate drunk um, because they were taking x-rays of my chest. I was like, you guys are just trying to get money out of me now. Like it's not my chest. And then I wanted to see my wife, um, but then they would have let me see my wife and there's this, this male the nurse over across the, uh, the counter, like behind the uh, guy that was watching me for suicide watch. Um, and he was saying, hey, you need to wait to see your wife because you may hurt her. Um, and I yelled, like, I was like, come say that, come, come here and say that. I would never hurt her. But he put that in my mind that that's what they thought of me in that chair, that I was going to hurt my wife. Um, I, I, I yelled some bogers and called him a nice, some nice words. Um, but then I realized I need to cut, cut, uh, settle down um, because uh, I didn't want to be handcuffed or anything to the bed. Um, so later on, they finally, the, uh, the, 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 nerd, the doctor came down and said, okay, yes, we're going to admit you. Um, you can either voluntarily be admitted or we can uh, admit you for doctor's orders. I admitted voluntarily because I knew at that time I'd reached my limit. I am, uh, my, my duffel, my rucksack is full. Um, so my wife finally came in and everything that I am trying to improve on is because of her. And seeing her face and the sad and scared look that she had when she came into my room. That is ever for a bit in my head, that is not going to happen again. So she finally came in. Um, you know, I told her to, I'll figure out, I'll, I'll, I'll get better. And she made sure, she, she's going to make sure I do. Um, but then I, uh, from there, I basically went to sleep. Um, the guy that I was yelling at, he got back at me just so you know, because he gave me my COVID test. And I swear that that nasal, he went all the way, all the way up. Um, so yeah, payback. So um, from there, I got uh, admitted to another hospital. I had to get in the ambulance, go uh, to Richmond, about a 40 minute drive from where I was currently at, um, where I got admitted to a, um, a hospital uh, that basically this hospital, um, I was there for about four days. Um, I also got in contact with the VA at that time from that hospital, um, kind of get the process started. That was where they're give, giving me my meds, my meds, putting me on meds um, and observations, really all that was. Um, so then from there, I was discharged, um, was finally working with the VA. I was uh, enrolled in two programs. Um, my first program was called the uh, Partial Hospitalization Program. Um, it was a two week uh, program, but basically you, uh, you go for two weeks all day and you are there at another hospital with um, other people that have gone through mental health issues. Um, the good thing about this group is that we were able to share our feelings and what we went through, because you also, I learned from other people as well as I hope they learned from what I went through. Um, so with that, one thing that we went through was we had to write a story about grief, um, basically a letter about why we're grieving. So I wrote a, a letter on grief um, during that, that time and I had to, um, you know, I presented it, cried my face off. Um, and then when I got home, I still needed to process it more. Like there's still stuff, like I, I was there, but I wasn't there at home. So I had, at that time, I knew that I needed to talk to someone else. So I called the National Suicide Hotline. I did, when I called them, I told them to, I want to talk to you. I don't have a plan. There's no plan. I just need to talk to someone because I went through this, this grieving process and I want to talk to someone more. Um, so with that being said, I also wanted my wife to hear me talking to someone because sometimes I, I can't talk to my spouse on this like but I wanted her to listen to what I was saying to the other person on the end of the line just so I'm talking to her but I'm not talking to her and she can understand what I'm going through 
So we did that. Um, it was a great, great discussion. Um, it led for further discussion with my wife and I, but I was talking, I was talking about it, I was improving. Uh, my next program was a intensive outpatient program. My intensive outpatient program basically was a three day, three day event or three days a week for half a day. So basically you're going back into going to work, trying to try, get back into the, the normal routines. So you call. Um, so that was that. Um, and I've learned that I need to, be able to let stuff out of my rug sack. So that's what these groups also help you with. Like, I know that I need to talk to a therapist. I go to therapy at least twice, once a month. This kind of, even if it's nothing, it's I'm really, I'm talking to someone about what's wrong, what's going on with my life. Just empty those, that rug sack. So it's not a heavy burden anymore. Um, I also, you know, um, I've been sober. My last drink was that that that, uh, that night. So seven months sober. Um, so that's uh, accomplished it for me that I continue to my sobriety. Um, and I also, some people may laugh. I love building Lego Lego uh, stuff. Not the yes, that laughter. Um, but if you look, there's a lot of stuff in there that EOD Techs may like to build and and uh, and you know because it gives me that like. I'm following directions and it gives me something that is an end product. But you look, you look at uh, you look at the sites, they're not like the Lego blocks you step on anymore. They're uh, they're pricey. Um, yeah. But so with that being said, I greatly appreciate you uh, my listening to my story. Um, you know, when I got home after my stay in the hospital, uh, you know, before I talked, uh, told my wife, I was like, maybe you should delete the messages so I don't see them. Um, but she did it. And I greatly appreciate that she did it because I read that everyone um, on Facebook, um, messages, answering you guys mean a lot to me. And I deeply you know, thank everyone that reached out to me. Um, and with that being said, you know, you know, the war, the war fighter, when you're out, think of you, think for yourself. You know, think about yourself, helping yourself. You've been always concerned about the safety of others, protecting your team, protecting the civilian population, protecting your unit. Don't forget when the, the war, the battle's over, to protect yourself. And that, would, I would thank you for, for allowing me to share. Thank you so much, John, for sharing your personal story with us. That means a lot to us, and hopefully, it will inspire other uh, other techs in the community to reach out for help um, if they're suffering um, now. So, um, our next guest speaker is Jeff Truex. Uh, Jeff is the co-founder and current president of After the Wrong Walk, a suicide prevention hotline and peer-to-peer -peer support group for EOD techs. Jeff was born and raised in Oakland, California. He joined the Army shortly after graduation and started his career as a combat engineer. In January of 1999, he graduated Explosive Ordnance Disposal School and had a rich EOD career and retired in 2014. Jeff is here to talk to us about After the Long Walk, which works diligently to support the EOD community. He is an avid motorcycle rider. He enjoys reloading and target shooting and likes to think of himself as a pretty good at outdoor cook. Uh, After the Long Walk is a suicide prevention hotline for EOD techs and their families. We're a group of active duty and EOD veterans and family members who have come together for one purpose, to help each other recognize that we're not alone. Our goals are to help educate each other about uh, services available to combat PTSD, encouragement to seek help, and ultimately prevent suicide. Our methods to reach our goals include peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, challenging activities, and being available 24 seven. Just a bit about myself, a little, little bit more. Um, a little bit of the same. Um, uh, 1994, thereabouts, 
I was a combat engineer attending the JRTC training uh, at Fort Polk. Uh, we were attacking a bunker complex and I was providing uh, Overwatch with a machine gun um, up on top of a hill. Somebody threw a grenade into one of the rooms of the bunker and the jungle clip was still on. Um, so of course it didn't go off. Um, the controllers, they cleared everyone out of the bunker and then two guys walked up into the bunker while everybody else was walking away and they found the grenade and they blew it up where it landed. Those guys calmly walked into what I thought was our worst day. Um, and at the time it was, because we weren't at war yet. Um, and at that moment, I knew what I was gonna do for the rest of my life. Um, I finally got to EOD school in the late 1900s. <laughs> and, and I graduated in 1999, uh, just to be stationed back at Fort Polk and do the exact same thing those guys did five years later. Um, four deployments, two ex-wives, uh, I retired in 2014 after designing and building and running with Chris, uh, the uh, McMahon Training Complex at Fort AP Hill. Now I live at Fort Bragg and I work, with JSOC, work on the JSOC compound, solving complex problems for our nation's war fighters. I uh, process work orders and change light bulbs, but the pay's good. <laughs> In November of 2015, the U.S. Army unit technician took his own life. Shortly after that event, Army First Sergeant Landon Jackson decided something needed to be done. Um, something needed to be done to dis disrupt the pattern of UD suicides. Several of us signed on with Landon um, to see what we could get done. We started a telephone hotline, we started a Facebook page, and we started a GoFundMe account. And that account raised uh, $4,500 November 2015. <laughs> To 2000 or May 2016. Our first positive action was in December of 2015 when the word help was posted on our Facebook page. Um, a good friend of mine and I were able to go visit, up, visit the caller in the hospital after he was recovered and uh, we, we, we talked to him for a little while. We had lunch and since then he, uh, he medically retired. He completed his bachelor's degree. He hiked the Appalachian Trail. Um, he completed postgraduate work with distinction in England, and now he's a military defense consultant. We believe we've made a difference in the number of EOD suicides, but we haven't stopped all of them. We have lost EOD techs that were members of our group. We have had many, many successes, but our record is not perfect. As of today, we have 5,680 members on our Facebook page, and that number continues to grow. And with every new member, the opportunity to connect with someone who is struggling grows. We can only hope that the right person is in the right place when the struggle gets to be too much. What we are is we are a 501c3 veteran nonprofit. We're a base of peer-to-peer -peer mentors, friends, compassionate individuals that have come together uh, and, and are committed to ending the act of EOD suicide. We're a source of references and, and resources to help EOD service members and veterans take pause when they're depressed or drunk or possibly looking to end their life. And we use the Columbia Suicide Security Rating Scale as a method to engage our callers. What we are not. We are not a medical resource. We are not an official reporting agency. We are not a religious organization. And we are definitely not a certified counselor. <laughs> How do we do it? We'll start with the phone line. We have an 800 number that is manned completely by volunteers. Every week we ask two EOD techs to volunteer to have the phone number forwarded to their personal line. Uh, to qualify for phone watch, we require two things. Be a bomb tech, sometimes a spouse, and be familiar with the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. The shift is one week long from Monday to Monday. Now, just as our motto is, you are not alone, you're not alone on phone watch either. Um, we have a chat room with 20 seasoned phone watch veterans, and we keep a back channel open open for our uh, weekly volunteers. So that way, if somebody calls and they're in crisis, we can trigger a flare and we can get people moving. We can get people moving. Whether it's calling local EMS or the chain of command, or just putting an EOD tech within reach of the caller, someone is always there. Our next line of defense is the Facebook page. Everybody knows somebody in this community uh, and everybody knows somebody who knows somebody else. Um, our Facebook page has many people 
that are tuned into the community and can muster folks to reach out uh, to meet up or rescue a bomb tech that might be struggling. We haven't done well on other social media platforms, but if somebody wants to volunteer to be a social media coordinator, we can talk afterwards. Uh, another startup opportunity is the app Sound Off. Um, and we'll probably talk more about this a little bit later, but Sound Off is an opportunity for EOD techs to speak with a professional mental health clinician or an EOD battle buddy. It's text, it's encrypted end to end, and it's done with complete anonymity. I worked on that word for like two weeks. <laughs> um, and as a as part of that, that system, there's an hour long session with a clinician that's paid for by the EOD Warrior Foundation. Our most important resource is you. You guys know your friends, your classmates, and your teammates. Um, you can feel when something is off. And when you act on that feeling, chances are you can save a life. That act can be reaching out and finding out who might be physically close to somebody or um, just calling out directly, just getting in touch and trying to jump in front of that train. Two more resources we have are our regional Facebook pages and the EOD help map. The regional pages, nearly one for every state, help make the community just a little bit smaller. This has spawned into picnics, meetups for coffee, hunting trips, fishing trips, and hikes. Um, the EOD help map has served to put people in the right place in an emergency or simply provided a friendly face to show up when extra hands are needed. So if you're looking to get involved, we post our request for volunteers on our Facebook page on Monday evenings. Um, if you don't have your name on the EOD help map, you can find a sign up form on our website and we're always looking for page administrators for our regional pages. The training for the CSSR, CSSRS can be found by scanning the back of our business card, which I'm at the table on the front, on the table at the front. And uh, there's also a link on our website and I post a link every week on our Facebook page. Thank you for the opportunity to sit on this panel and I hope we have some great conversations. Okay, uh, thank you so, so much, Jeff, um, for everything that you do with After the Long Walk. And I have to say, um, in my position uh, with the foundation, I often find myself talking to the EOD techs that are struggling and sometimes um, suicidal. So I, I value our partnership with After the Long Walk because I myself am also not a licensed counselor. Um, so when I have those conversations, I immediately reach out to Jeff and he'll find out where they are and he will get them the support that they need. So um, thank you very much. Our, our next speaker is Dr. Thomas Kruger. Dr. Kruger is a licensed clinical psychologist and the owner of Kruger Wellness Institute in Niceville, Florida. <laughs> she has a doctorate in clinical psychology and a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. She's been a mental health provider for over 13 years. She is an Air Force veteran, EOD military spouse for over 16 years, and grew up as a military brat. Welcome, Dr. Kruger. Um, so I'm here today to further the conversation about how can we each contribute to commit suicide. And I too may get emotional and very passionate about this, or so Jeff's story. Um, but the question becomes, how can we each individually do our part? And obviously with the rising and astronomical rates, um, like last year being one of the highest that we've seen, this is not an easy question. And so today I'm going to focus on what are steps you can take um, with people that you care about, people that you love, people that you know, um, in order to help uh, identify when they may need help, what to ask and what to do once you get some answers to those questions. Truth is, if you're in this room or if you know someone that served in the military or a veteran, they are 50% higher than if you're their same age to be at risk for suicide. It's a fact. So we're all, all of you are risk factor, have a risk factor automatically. Um, so today we're gonna cover um, Warning signs, what do I say? 
We're going to talk about making a plan and we're going to talk about how do you get help. And I created a card. Um, I looked for a bunch of resources online in order to help. You know, one of the things that Rhea was saying is, you know, we have all this literature and all this stuff, but how can we access it easily if we're in a space where someone's in need? If we have someone that has a story that is is shifting fast and what, what resource can we grab? And so I, I apologize, the print is small, but it's meant to provide a quick and uh, easy access resource to you. And we're going to cover this today. Um, we'll leave with it today so you can keep it in your cards, your wallet, whatever. Um, and um, so before we talk about signs to look for, let's talk about who might be higher risk in transition or who might be higher risk for suicide. Um, people that are in transition, if you believe it or not, um, and I think the those that have deployed might not understand this, but those who actually joined the military, served in the service, and have not deployed are actually at higher risk for suicide. Fact, the statistics show over and over and over again. That being said, if you are a veteran or an active duty service member that's returning from deployment, you are now at high at risk for suicide. Other times that we can know that someone's in this transition state or what we call risk factors are increased are financial concerns, high stressors, any type of relationship shifting, losing a family member, losing a friend, death, someone who's committed, uh, attempted suicide and they're hospitalized. Anything that has this, this increase in stress can increase risk factors. And so when we look at the uh, Columbia rating scale that was being discussed, that's some of the things we look at is what are the risk factors and essentially comes up with a total score that tells us where you fall in that risk factor. Um, so those are things that we want to look at. We want to look at this person in transition, where are they in life? What is their baseline? So we start to talk about signs here in a moment. I want you to consider the baseline of the person. So as was shared the story, it uh, with John's story, he things started to increase for him. His baseline wasn't like it was when he his story finally came to um, getting out. Okay, um, Jared, can you, can you come pass these out for me, please? So this is the card that I've, oh, okay. This is my husband, Jared, over 21 years of service, retired in May. <laughs> How about that? Okay. I've never been accused of being a quiet person. <laughs> okay. Can I have a bunch of these so you can take them with you if you like? This is sort of phase one. We're going to continue to adopt this, adopt this card. Um, all right. So, warning signs. Um, yeah. I, here's my first draft. It was so tiny. It was so tiny. So, I took it off, took it off, but this is about as small as I could get and still give you what I felt like you might need in the event that there was concern and you weren't sure. And, you know, we all have the classes, we've all seen the seminars, we, but, you know, the military is doing a better job. We have phenomenal resources out there. But in those moments, I wanted you to have something that you could reference that at least give you some words to say or know who to call. So I do apologize. Um, all right, so I'm not gonna read these off to you, but I'm gonna talk about some of the most, I, I think there was, important ones. Obviously, someone's wanting to kill themselves and they're talking about it. this is a huge concern. We're going to skip to listen and act. We're going to create a plan and we're going to talk about um, Other things that sometimes are overlooked is sleeping more or sleeping less, um, drinking more or drinking less, using substances or using less. Um, a lot of times when we'll see a more longer acting plan, we'll start to see items being given away. We'll see um, uh, sort of closing of someone's affairs, maybe asking for forgiveness or getting documents done. Um, I have tons of stories, but one, one person was where I mean, he boxed all of his stuff up. He had everything boxed up, everything nice and neat, had his will and everything laid out. Um, luckily, we were able to say he was his life. He did not take his own life. Um, a friend knocked on the door because something he said on text felt a little off. And his friend knocked on the door right as he was choosing to, to make that last step. Um, so sometimes you'll see these things happening. Um, sometimes the signs are not as obvious. Um, let's see. Uh, withdrawing and isolating is a huge one. And you'll see a slow isolation. And remember, I talked about baseline earlier. So you might have some people in your life that are a little bit more withdrawn, and they do have some of these warning signs that I'm talking about. They too already have a suspicious suicide. It only a bad day, another event. 
um, losing a comrade. I and mean, we, we see these events where there's all these traumas that build up, there's all of these significant stressors, and then it takes that last one. So what's that baseline? What's getting worse? What's been happening in that person's life? And our next step is to listen. What are they saying to us? What are they not saying to us that we might have used to say? And not to be afraid to ask questions. So that is where we can make the most change is observe what's different, what are we hearing, and then start to ask. And this is where I can write a whole card on questions because this is where families tell me, I don't know what to say. You do this for a living, it's easy for you. No, it's not, it's really not. Every story is different. When we're sitting and you're engaging with someone, I had my four o'clock appointment last night, my session. I almost ate grabbed him. It was a tough session and I'm finding the words for him for a very long time. How do I engage in this conversation so I'm not shaming and I'm not creating a more, a more isolation? It's hard. And so the easiest thing I can do for you is give you questions that are more open-ended or encourage you just to listen. Maybe share what you've seen lately. Hey, no, I noticed lately you're drinking a little more. Is there a reason why? Right? The questions I dipped on here is, are you thinking about hurting yourself? The research shows over and over and over again, you cannot cause someone to commit suicide by asking, are you thinking of hurting yourself or saying the word suicide? You're not gonna put this idea in the right, oh, you're right, no, I have, but I think I will. It's just not the case. It's not what the research is showing you guys. And I know it might sound a little counterintuitive, but that's what our science is showing. Um, if they are feeling whatever, you know, what's on your mind, how are you, you know, what's going on, or are you, have you been sad lately? Some of these, these warning signs that you might ask about, Tell them what they've been feeling that way. And then just listen. Ask what has helped in the past with, with previous coping skills. Everyone's been through something. And they're still sitting there talking to you. So somehow they got through it. What was it? Was it the guy that I was working with last night? He likes to build. He built like a whole bathroom last time he was in this state. Um, and so we, I, there's five projects you better be working on right now. <laughs> because we've got, he's, he's building, he's doing, he's got, he's, he rides motorcycles. Um, so, you know, what's worked in the past and how can we encourage those things? Um, this is where we then have to start taking the next steps. And this is, how do I go from what they've said to calling for help, do I know to call for help? And so some of the next things that I'll encourage you to do, don't leave them alone. I don't care if it's 2 a.m. I don't care what you have the next day. Please don't leave them alone. Help find a second line of defense if you are not able to be there. A family member, maybe they'd actually prefer a family member, a spouse. Someone, or maybe this, it's the spouse hearing these things. And I shared previously with John's story, maybe it's not the most comfortable person to talk to. Who can we talk to? Can we get them there? Um, the drug and alcohol use, if that's increasing, what we see is if we can get them to stop using whatever that is, that is significantly going to reduce their chances of suicide if actually taking action. So um, do not say negative things. You cannot shame someone out of suicide shaming, guilt, trying to hold, like reminding them what's important to them can be encouraging. You know, you know, maybe so, like even yesterday, I, I'm, I'm talking about things that I wouldn't normally talk about, just reminding him about his safety plan and what's important, reminding him about his kid and what it was like for him when his kid attempted suicide and he had a stroke at the hospital, right? And just sharing um, positive things, positive things to remind them for reasons to live. So no shaming, no negativity if possible, or please don't. Um, those coping skills we talked about earlier, start to encourage those. And then um, ask about weapons in the home. If you don't already know, do they have a means to commit suicide? If you talk to them, they're like, hey, I don't want to hurt myself. I'm thinking about shooting myself. Do you have a gun? Please do not be afraid to ask. If you call for help, they're going to ask you these questions. Do they have a plan? Do they have a means? If there's guns in the home and this person is in an escalated state, it's their safety and theirs and for those that are responding. So the last thing is get help. And this is one of those things where I hear, and I've heard this time and time again, I don't want them to be mad at me. And I get it, I do. I actually, when I, I've had to make around several people where I kind of start with, they're gonna be mad at me, but I care about you more than I care about how angry you are with me. And because I care about you and I care about your commitment and the things that you've shared today, I'm gonna call somebody else for help in this state. If someone is suicidal, even, even as a licensed clinical psychologist, the police department will come and make their own evaluation, and they then um, decide whether or not to baker out someone. So, I can 
<laughs> um, so that's going to happen for you too. It would happen for me. It's going to happen for you. The police department's going to come and they're going to be the ones to take them voluntarily or involuntarily. Correct. <laughs> um, so I'm not, it doesn't go just straight from a mental health provider. It's, there, it's always, so 911 is always a safe bet. Someone's going to show up and step in. Um, if you're not comfortable with that or if that's not where you think things are at, um, you can call for help. So in the back, I've tried to summarize the different um, help. Jeff, I need to put your stuff on here too. <laughs> Make it easy for. Um, so 988, the uh, suicide hotlines and national suicide hotlines have merged the crisis line. So um, dial 988, veterans dial one. Um, you can call if you're not sure what to say. Hey, I've just talked to my partner. This is what I'm hearing. Um, I'm gonna try to get them on the phone. What can you help me say? Um, I've told them to say, hey, I've got a veteran here. We're on the line. She's only willing to go to a VA. Can you help me find a closest VA that would take her um, on a voluntary needs? Because voluntary versus involuntary is going to be very different on getting services in the state, well, any state really, because of, of the overwhelming need. Um, you can chat online, you can text. There's every available resource to ask for help. So you've got the number, shoot a text to them and say, hey, I've got someone in the house. This is the thing happening. I don't know exactly what to say next, and they're gonna help you too. So today I, 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 am, I work with veterans and, and military and civilians all the time, but today is about how can you help prevent? What can you see? How can you reach out? We now know, know about Facebook, there's Facebook um, and uh, different resources that I, I don't even have in the park for you to be able to reach out today. So. I think the last thing I'm going to say before I close or we open up for questions is this. Your job is not to fix the problem when someone is suicidal. It's not. I don't fix the problem. When we go in from we're doing therapy to crisis session, I stop doing therapy and I do crisis work. And that's the same thing as this. That is getting that person the help they need. They're going to get, they're going to need intensive care. They're going to need psychiatry. They're going to need all the different things that happen within a, an intensive treatment program. I'm not fixing the problem. So keep that in mind is that when you hear these things, don't be afraid. They're not putting that on you to fix. They want you to listen. So open your ears, ask the questions, listen for the red flags, and please don't be afraid to ask for help. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Thomas. I really appreciate that. And I, um, I hope that um, spouses and loved ones can take away uh, a lot on what to do if they um, end, up, end up finding themselves in that situation. Um, I want to thank John, um, Jeff, and Thomas for your time, for your stories, and for your service to our community with this talk. Um, we're going to end the talk and we're going to start a, a question and answer session. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for joining us. You're welcome to stay for the question and answers. Um, there's also a, a brewery behind us that's owned by um, some reservists that we're going to do. That's really nice. I think they're going to have a food truck. If, if anybody wants to stay and, and socialize, um, you're welcome to. Um, and I also want to let everybody know that as in my position with the um, Warrior Foundation, I have learned about a lot of different resources that are available to veterans. Um, and please, when you leave, stop by the table because I have different flyers and, um, and different resources available. Um, just to name a few, um, of course, we have the PATH program to Boulder Test, and that helps um, a lot of uh, EOD technicians uh, learn about post-traumatic growth, which is a wonderful program. Um, there's a great program called Home Base that's based out of Boston. Um, that's an excellent uh, three-week intensive uh, program for veterans and specifically have a program for TBI and PTSD, which um, I've been really recommending to a lot of EOD techs that have untreated TBI and PTSD. Um, completely paid for. And that program is actually sponsored by the Boston Red Sox. Um, so that's a, a resource. Um, Sound Off, the app that Jeff had mentioned is a wonderful uh, resource. We're happy to uh, be working with them. Um, I, I do a podcast called Behind the Warrior, and I try to highlight different resources that are available to the community. 
So I just want everybody here and anybody watching on the Zoom or who might hear this talk at a later time to know that our foundation is working very hard to, to help you connect to resources to help support you and to help support your, your family and our, our whole community at large. And um, there's a lot of people out there that care and want to help and want to prevent suicide. So I think that's that's my bottom line. And then um, I guess we'll open it up for, for questions. And um, we're open for questions on Zoom too. So please feel free to ask. I think what I'll do is ask my three guest speakers to come up because we don't know <laughs> the question will need to be answered by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. None yet. When are you going to open the keys? In love with this moment. Their QR code is, is up there too. Hey, Maria. Yeah. I've actually got a question teed up. Okay. You can ask one to yeah. start off. Um, John, first off, thanks for sharing your story. Some of that stuff's hard to say the least. So I really appreciate it. The main question I have is. You where you are right now, if you could have a conversation with your previous self six to eight months before the event, what might be something you would tell that person? Uh, yeah, so something that I might tell my, myself six, eight months ago um, would be don't compare yourself and your experiences to other people. Um, think you are your own self. Um, and your mental health is your mental health. Just like your physical health and your physical health, your mental health is, it's you, it's who you are. Um, and, you know, just be, mental health, with, and, you know, we always are saying our, you know, the services that we've done, the deployments, but civilian life is also gonna, you know, increase um, your mental health. And, you know, stuff at home, stuff with your families, it's gonna add to your, uh, you know, to your mental health. Uh, so I would say don't compare your, your issues to others. Um, if you're feeling that you are not yourself, talk to someone about it, just talk. So, and it'll help. Thanks. Anybody else have any questions, thoughts? Wanted to add maybe something that you said that you thought was important to hear? Totally got what you said, Jeff. Um, it, is after long walk EOD specific, or is it any branch and the service? It's it's EOD specific. Okay. Um, we, we we try to keep it within our ranks. Now, there have been opportunities where an EOD tech has said, "Hey, my friend needs to talk to somebody." Absolute call. Um, but we try to advertise strictly with EOD guys because you know uh, that's what we know. Uh, I. I could talk to a grunt, not, I can talk, I can talk a gun out of a grunt's mouth, um, but I can't relate to all the things that he's done. So we, uh, we, we try to know, keep what we know. And I, I would absolutely love to be a model for um, vote. Um, I'd love to be a model for, for other um, MOSs and, and jobs and guys that, you know, other services just follow what we're doing. We started really small and we're staying that way. And I'd love to see other people figure that out as well. I had a question. What is the difference between voluntary and not voluntary? Sure, sure. So voluntary is as it sounds. Um, if you meet Baker at requirement, they're going to take you whether you like it or not. And so they'll they'll ask voluntary because the laws are set such that we have to give you dignity in that time. And they're going to try and talk you into coming willingly. We started in a clinic. The police officers are trained to do so to manage that situation to that the way you would want to handle it with a loved one. So if we can talk you to do it voluntarily, we can take you in, but they take you in, excuse me, you can get that evaluation. And then if you aren't that you don't full, meet full requirements for Baker acting, they will release you. Um, if you go in voluntarily, it's it looks the same once you get there. It just doesn't always feel the same. And there's another trauma, and there's increased risk, and it's all the other things. Um, but if you have to go involuntarily, a lot of times there'll be um, an automatic 40 hour, eight, eight hour hold. 
And so they'll hold you, they'll, they'll look at it, and all these different providers that are going to speak with you. And then there's a, 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 like a mini court that meets, and then they decide whether or not you're safe to be released. And they do that every so often. Um, the state laws have really, really been able to, um, in my opinion, so much more than in the past, be able to protect the person that's there as far as getting the evaluation. However, we have worked with situations where it didn't feel like that was happening. And so um, that's, I hope that answers the question. Yes, yeah. Sure. Can anyone hear me? I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Shipping hat. Oh, I don't know. Uh, Hi, this oh. is Ron. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? a question? Go ahead and type it um, on the sidebar and we'll read it out to the room. Work, brother. I don't know how to do that. Sorry, it's just like um, metaverse. I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> the next version of this, you're going to have to find it. There. Send it to the host, right? Okay. Oh, yeah. I don't know. He's tight. No. Tight. No. I that was tight. Oh, I don't know Zoom very well. You're going to have to forgive me. Where do I type it? Okay. So I saw that the uh, uh, Mo had put out for the path, the uh, for all female EOD retreat. Oh, it's and I was like, sweet. And I looked into it, but every it seems every female veteran thing that involves female, as soon as I step up, it always goes to where did the bad man touch you in the swimsuit so where did it always go to sexual assault? And I was like, I wasn't involved in it. I was military veteran, female EOD tech. Why can't we do a fishing retreat like the guys do? Why can't we do this? And then Mo's like, nope, sorry. Our, our, our female EOD retreat is about sexual trauma. And I go, I am so sorry that happened to them. I was involved in that. But can we have something that doesn't evolve? It's more general. Around, mental health. Yeah. Mental health Fair or question. PTSD or something like that. Like, ooh, not this side. It, can we have something just for female EOD techs? A good time? A vision retreat? So, um, you know, something that we like to do? Mary Kuzik. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, Mary. Um, she yeah. went on a uh, fishing trip. Um, yeah, outside of the that she went on that. She had a great time. Exactly. Um, and yeah. it, it, whenever I find, um, whenever I find a resource like that, or somebody shares it, try to share it and, and get the information out and, and share that deeper and more broad. So I'll talk to Mary. Um, that was that was great. She Yeah. But there's, there's, there's a bigger picture out there as well. Um, there's a, a group called the Fallen Outdoors. Say again. Is our Boulder retreat? Boulder Crest? Um, so because I know the one that's in yeah. Arizona is specifically for uh, sexual assault or other traumatic things. Because I, I talked to Mo about that. I, I went out of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I um, think that's great and wonderful. Yeah, no, yeah. no, I can actually great to I, help people. Bria, will you share online with what she's asking? So, okay, someone else goes the same way. Like, I don't, I'm not sure how, how to rephrase that. that ask. Um, but what I want to say is, um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I know that the path retreats, um, there's a woman's path and there's a men's path. And then, um, I think we used to do a family path. Mm -hmm. Um, but my understanding is that it, it is not specific to sexual trauma. There, there, program, there right? is a side, side thing to that. That's right. what I was informed about. So I was like, Nope, I'm going to that. Yeah, no, no, I don't. I would have to talk to Mo because my understanding okay. is that it's not, it's not specific to sexual trauma. Um, the other thing is that you know we have a retreats through the foundation that are EOD centric, obviously, because we want to support the EOD community. So all of our other retreats, we had a wake for warriors that was wakeboarding. Um, that's open to men and, and women and families, so it's not specific at all. And um, and we're developing different retreats and fun things to do. We have the Blast Day where we 
um, partnered and um, EOD techs and their partners or significant other, whoever they wanted to bring could go out and blow some things up together. So that wasn't gender specific. So I think, yeah, um, I think the path one is the only one that's gender specific. So if you see anything on the website that you're interested in, like, please, please apply. And then if you have any feedback of, of a retreat that you might want us to develop in the future, we would love to have your, your input on that um, because we're always trying to think of new things that the community would like and that would improve their morale. So I just appreciate your feedback and maybe we can have more conversations on it in the future. Okay. Yeah. Get a question. So I got, I got Shipstead's question. Uh, Ryan asked, um, wanted to ask people like, like, like him are instructed by mental health not to fully participate in something like this. Um, what else can they do to help the program? Um, so I think he's, uh, his doc said, hey, don't, don't, don't volunteer on the phone line. You're not quite ready for that yet. Um, and the biggest thing you can do is, is help spread the word um, and keep the, keep the request valid on Monday evenings, really, so that more people see it. Um, and then comment on, share, share your experience, um, you know, what's going on with you, what, whatever you can share. Um, you may not be ready to listen to somebody's story on the phone, but you might be ready to share your own. So that's one of the things you can do to help. Um, just a thought. Did that answer your question, Ryan? Absolutely, brother. Thank you. You're muted. There you go. Give a thumbs you up. Yeah. Can, okay. can you read that question? I think that's a new. Is that another one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you read that from here? That's from Greg. I can read it if you want. John, thank you for telling your story. Based on your experience, is there something you'd like to see the EOD Warrior Foundation might be able to do? that could be beneficial for members of the community. Uh, I think put and keep this, uh, this type of environment or this type of forum as an ongoing because um, well, hopefully from this, other people will hear about it um, and it, it doesn't have to be just the EOD side, you know, the, when this is shared, there's going to be a lot of other people that will probably share the video. So a lot of other families that aren't EOD may see it. And then and that's just something that I hope that this continues. This is, this is just the start and it's not the end, um, because this is something that I could tell it's passionate with the EOD uh, foundation. And also, you know, uh, after the long walk and those two organizations, bringing this to light and um, make allowing me to share my story, which is definitely, um, it's an, it helps me. Um, and that's one thing it helps me. Um, and then it hopefully it helps someone on the, the back end as well. So I hope I just continue this as possible. 